Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Uh, I, I showed you an example of a particular Heisenberg in a storage system. Um, then uh, I introduced the programming language P um, with this particular uh, tool chain. So you have a P program which has code and models and specifications and tests. And then the compiler uh, both generates executable code and it also does uh, uh, concurrency unit testing. At the very end, we talked about the difference between modeling and programming. Um, okay, then we talked about the specifics of the P language. In particular, it's, the, it's an actor style model of computation or also known as a state machine, uh, communicating state machines. Uh, we did this little uh, uh, animation to show you how state machines are running concurrently and communicating with each other by exchanging uh, messages, each message is an event and a payload value, a data value. Um, we looked at how P programs get executed. Uh, then we started looking at uh, issues of modeling, in particular model functions and uh, the dollar sign, the dollar represents non-deterministic choice. Um, and uh, at, towards the very end, we, we looked at model machines and we, 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 we we attempted to understand how to model the timer facility in an operating system using uh, a state machine. Uh, so that's where uh, we ended yesterday. Uh, do you have any questions about the material yesterday? Okay, great. So continuing, um, so we have so far looked at the P programming model and we have looked at um, uh, the distinction between code and models. Um, now uh, I'm going to show you what specifications look like. Right? Um, so in general, when you have a concurrency unit test, uh, it captures a whole set of executions, lots of executions very compactly. Uh, but the real power of, uh, power of concurrency unit test comes from uh, the idea that along each execution that the testing tool generates uh, in, in that unit test, uh, some deep specifications can, can get checked. So P has various mechanisms for writing down these specifications. So there are some uh, uh, specifications that you get for free or with very little effort. The most important one is um, unhandled event exception. So um, uh, as I explained yesterday, unless an, ev uh, unless an event is explicitly deferred in a state, um, it will be uh, dequeued if it is at in from the front of the queue, okay? Uh, only if uh, the event at the front of the queue is deferred uh, would you, uh, would the control skip over that. So if uh, the event at the front of the queue is uh, uh, removed, then there must be a handler available in the state to process it. If no handler is available, uh, then an unhandled event exception is thrown and um, uh, that's an indication of uh, an error. Um, so in P, we also have data types, and uh, you can you can create you have sequences and maps and uh, um, tuples, name tuples uh, like structs, C structs, and you also have this type called any. Uh, so any is uh, a little bit like the void star type in C or the object type in a language like Java or uh, C sharp. So uh, sometimes you want to uh, send values over the wire and there could be any kind of value. So in the type system you capture that by using the type any. So once you introduce the type any in the language, uh, you have to uh, uh, introduce a cast operation also because on the any type no operations are allowed, so you have to downcast into some reasonable type before you can start doing operations on it. So if there is an illegal cast, uh, then uh, an exception is thrown. So this is very classical, no surprises here. Uh, you have an assert statement in the language also, so you can uh, basically do local safety checks uh, within a machine uh, by using the assert statement. 
the assert statesman can, can only refer to the variables that are in scope inside the machine. Okay. So, um, sometimes um, in P programs, um, it is also important to check not just local assertions, but also global assertions. Uh, assertions that uh, talk about correlations uh, among the state of multiple uh, concurrently executing machines. So, the local assertion that uh, I mentioned earlier does not give you that power because in a local assertion you can only access the state of one machine. So, supposing you wanted to say that when a machine M1 is uh, in a state X, uh, machine N2 must be in state Y. How do you capture something like that? Um, so, in, in P the mechanism for pulling that off is uh, monitors. So, we have two kinds of monitors, safety monitors and uh, liveness monitors. So, I will use the word monitor and specifications uh, interchangeably. Um, so, a monitor is another state machine, it basically subscribes to some events and the idea is that it is just observing those events as they are flowing from one machine to another and if uh, an event that it is observing is sent from one machine to another, it also gets funneled into the monitor and the monitor can take some action on it. So, the monica, monitor would typically um, uh, update its local store. Um, so, because the monitor can observe any event that is uh, flowing in the system, it can observe events that are being generated by multiple you know different machines and that is how you establish correlation uh, between the states of different machines. I will give you examples of that. So, a safety property generalizes the notion of local assertion, you can capture uh, global invariants. Um, similar to local assertions, uh, uh, its violation is exhibited by a finite execution. Okay. Um, so, that is relatively easy to understand. Now, uh, yes. Monitor is a machine that exists separately, it is just observing the calculations that are happening in the system and when events flow from regular machines from one to another, a copy of those events gets funneled into the monitor also, but the monitor exists separately. So, actually I will show you, uh, I will come back to liveness monitors later, first let me show you a safety monitor just to make the ideas a little bit concrete. So, here is how you write down a, a safety specification in, in P. So, uh, spec is a keyword, uh, safety is the name of this state machine and uh, the monitors keyword you can after that list a sequence of event names and these are the events that this monitor, uh, this specification is interested in observing. So, um, um, in the initial state, so pending is initialized to 0, the default value for uh, in types and then uh, in the initial state, uh, there is this handler on ping, whenever uh, a ping event is observed, it increments pending by 1. Okay. And uh, here the assertion, uh, uh, the, there is a there is an assertion here, uh, which says pending is less than or equal to 3. Okay. So, note the interesting thing here is that the ping event may have been generated by any machine that is running in the system. Okay. Does not matter what machine generates that event, it is going to be funneled into this monitor. So, that is how you establish correlation between events that are happening across machines. Okay. Okay, so, going back to liveness properties, uh, who um, can I get a show of hands, how many people have heard of liveness properties before? One person few, 3, 4, 5, okay, all right. Um, so, but you must have, uh, uh, you must be familiar, familiar with the issue of termination. So, when you write a while loop, you expect it to terminate regardless of the uh, input, input value, right. If you write a non-terminating while loop, it is a sign that there is a bug in your program. So, uh, liveness properties generalize the notion of these non termination uh, bugs in sequential programs to concurrent programs. So, uh, the issue of uh, non termination in 
concurrent programs is more complex um, because um, uh, even if each event handler, so you know in a concurrent program such as P, event handlers are executing inside each concurrently executing machine, right. It could be that each event handler terminates, but the program as a whole is not making any progress. So, the following could happen that the event handler, an event handler executes, it, it terminates before terminating it sends an event to another machine that another machine uh, processes that event using an event handler which terminates sends an event back to this machine and this keeps doing the same thing. Now, um, looks like you know the computation is proceeding, but it may be that there is some kind of a loop here where there is no logical progress being made in the computation. So, uh, that is what Leibniz properties try to uh, try to capture. So, uh, similar to non termination problems violation of a Leibniz property is also exhibited by an infinite trace. So, uh, an infinite trace is a violation of the Leibniz property if something good does not happen in it right we are waiting for something good to happen, but it just never happens ok. So, uh, I will give you an example now. Let us say, um, so here is a here is a Leibniz specification, this Leibniz specification observes two events uh, request and response REQ and RESP. So, um, here we see some new attributes, so we see that um, states are annotated by cold uh, these these attributes cold and hot ok. So, when this machine starts uh, running it is in this uh, start state in it and it is waiting for the request event. When request is observed it goes to the wait state, in the wait state it is waiting for a response and then it goes back to uh, the init state ok. So, what this is trying to capture is this idea that um, every request must be eventually followed by a response ok. So, what, what we want what, what this cold and hot business is saying is that we do not want the temperature of the execution if you will to become very high. So, how does the temperature of an execution increase? Well, it increases if uh, the execution stays in a hot state for every time step that it stays in a hot state its temperature increases by a little bit. So, if it stays in a hot state forever without entering a cold state, so entering a cold state resets the temperature back to 0 ok and we do not want the temperature to become infinity right. The, the temperature becoming infinity is a sign that we are not making progress yes. So, yes, so typically this the notion of liveness the classical notion of liveness uh, uses infinity as the threshold often times you can uh, convert a liveness into a bounded safety bounded liveness property by imposing a, a finite threshold. In that case the violation is not an infinite execution anymore it is just becomes a finite execution which increases the temperature more than certain amount. that may be possible too, but I do not know how to do that yeah. So, uh, so, uh, so what we what this liveness property is saying is that you the temperature should uh, stay finite. So, what that means is that uh, um, you cannot stay in a hot state forever after a certain point um, you have to enter a cold state to reset the temperature back to 0. So, um, so this this particular definition is inspired just some background thing I mean you do not you do not really need to know about omega regular properties and Rabin acceptance conditions and what not, but those of you who are mathematically inclined and enjoy automata theory perhaps uh, might be interested in this little tidbit. So, I am sure many of you have studied the theory of uh, finite automata. So, finite automata are acceptors of finite strings right. 
well there is a theory of uh, omega automata also uh, an omega automaton uh, is an acceptor of uh, infinite strings okay so you again have a, a finite alphabet and you define the set of uh, uh, infinite strings over that alphabet and an omega automaton uh, breaks that set into the set to into the uh, members that are accepted and the members that are not accepted okay so uh, uh, just like in finite automata um, there is a notion of accepting states there is a notion of accepting uh, states in these omega automata also I am not going to go into that and one particular classic notion is uh, uh, Rabin accepting uh, condition so it turns out that what I am defining here using cold and hot states is equivalent to the Rabin acceptance condition and that is nice because what that means is that any uh, property that is expressible by one of these uh, omega regular automata can be expressed in our system also so this is very uh, expressive uh, because uh, you know all temporal logic specifications can be compiled down to omega automata and this uh, is able to express all omega regular properties okay um, okay so uh, we talked about um, how to partition infinite executions into good executions and bad executions good executions are those whose temperature stays finite bad, bad executions are those whose temperature becomes infinity right however the story does not uh, stop there yet you know this, uh, this liveness business is a can of worms so you have to understand a few more things it turns out that there is a notion of fairness constraints and uh, in order to, um, to, to distinguish good from bad you also have to pay attention to fairness constraints. So let me explain that using an example. So imagine that you have a machine A and a machine B. So machine A sends to machine B the request event. Okay? and then machine B on receiving request it uh, sends a response back to back to A right. So in the in the semantics of uh, B uh, it is possible to uh, not schedule B at all okay. So I can choose to create a schedule an execution in which machine A executes the send instruction and after that I never schedule B okay so this is what you would consider an unfair execution because it is not giving B chance to execute well if I did that it is not surprising that the specification we saw on the last slide is not satisfied of course in that case B is not given a chance to execute no wonder uh, that monitor is going to explode with a very high temperature the request was sent but no response was forthcoming well the guy who is going to send the response I am not even allowing it to execute okay. So uh, what that means is that you should only generate consider an infinite execution as a violation of the liveness property if it is fair if it is not fair then it is nobody's fault it is okay you know do not worry about that okay so that is an issue of fair scheduling and 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 the P liveness checker actually does do fair scheduling of machines so it will not report a, uh, an error trace if it is unfair the second issue is uh, you know the issue of fair choice so let us make the example in the previous slide a little bit more complicated so machine A sent uh, to machine B the request event okay and machine B was given a chance to execute so we did fair scheduling so we are going to give machine B a chance to execute however what what is happening in machine B is a little bit more complicated so before sending the response back to B machine B is polling some external world maybe it is talking to some kind of a hardware sensor it is waiting for some input from the user a human being so it is just polling for that input and only when the input arrives is it going to send the response back okay so this is usually how what polling loops look like yes oh that is a typo that is a typo that should be um, A here 
So, uh, so the, the way I am modeling polling here is by using non-deterministic choice. So, you know, it can succeed any time. Well, I mean the issue with this kind of modeling is that um, a dollar can, there is an execution in which dollar always evaluates to true. In which case this while loop will not terminate. Well, if this while loop does not terminate, then no matter how many chances I give to B to execute, we will never get to execute the send instruction. Okay? So, again we run into trouble. Okay? So, this is uh, providing such an execution as a violation of the previous liveness property is also kind of bogus, right? Because there is this assumption that machine V is making that eventually its polling loop is going to terminate because some user input will arrive, right? Okay. So, to model that, we introduce this notion of fair non deterministic choice. So, that is indicated by double dollar. Okay. So, double dollar means that if that choice is evaluated infinitely many times, then it must evaluate to true infinitely many times and false infinitely many times. Notice that this notion of fairness is an infinitary notion of fairness. It is not this probabilistic notion of fairness where uh, in a long enough time the number of true evaluations and the number of false evaluations is roughly the same. For example, uh, it would be considered fair if it evaluates to true once for every 1 trillion times it evaluates to false. That would be completely fine from, a, uh, from this infinitary fairness standpoint. Okay? And that is all we need to show that uh, when um, every request is eventually followed by, by a response. Uh, because eventually uh, this uh, double dollar is going to evaluate to false and then uh, we are going to uh, exit this loop. Okay. All right. Questions? Pardon? Uh, spin lock. No, I think that you can model um, spin lock pretty accurately using a combination of fair scheduling and fair choice. Because, um, so imagine that a particular machine is spinning on a spin lock because the lock is currently held by a different machine. Well, because of fair scheduling, I am going to give that machine a chance to execute infinitely often. It will continue to make progress. Eventually, it is going to release the lock and then uh, my lock will, I uh, will get the lock. But maybe you are worried about the issue that uh, if there is contention, so one guy is starved out. Um, so, if there is two guys contending for the spin lock, one guy always succeeds at the expense of the other. Yeah, I do not know if you can, I do not know, I do not know, maybe you cannot model that with this, not sure, got to think about that. Hmm. Okay. A random variable on a? Yes. Yeah. No, it's very simple. You don't need to resort to probabilities to evaluate that. You look at an infinite execution. If that infinite execution uh, evaluates to this double dollar infinitely many times, meaning that it goes through this control location infinitely many times, then it must be the case that it is evaluating to returning true infinitely many times and evaluating false infinitely many times. Yeah, you can just examine the, pretend you can examine an infinite execution. right? Um, if you do not like this idea that you are examining an infinite execution, you can characterize it using um, uh, a formula, using a universal, uh, a formula with universal and existential quantifiers for example. You don't. So all I'm trying to say is that it's all logic, math, um, discrete logic. Um, uh, to define this kind of notion of fairness, you uh, you don't need to use probabilities. More questions? Okay. All right. So I'm going to show you some code now. Okay. 
So um, just to uh, uh, wrap it all together, um, because some of these examples are kind of abstract, so I want to show you a real example or uh, 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 to give you a better sense of what, uh, uh, what you can do with P. So the example I have chosen uh, to show you is a failure detector example. So this is a very common uh, component of a distributed system. The idea behind a failure detector is that there are these physically distributed nodes and nodes can go down for a variety of reasons. You know the hard disk fails or power goes down or there is some hardware failure. Um, so there is a failure detector uh, uh, code uh, that is running on some node and uh, it periodically uh, polls all the nodes in the system uh, um, and then uh, ask them to send a response back to, to, uh, to say that they are alive. Right? And if it does not receive a response within a certain amount of time, then it just uh, considers that node to have failed. And um, uh, it, it allows uh, listeners to register for uh, failure notifications and uh, all the listeners who have registered for the failure notification they get notified um, if a certain node is deemed to have failed. So uh, what we want to do is we want to, we want to write down the code for the, folio, uh, for the failure detector in P. Um, we want to uh, compose that with uh, nodes that this uh, failure detector is uh, trying to uh, estimate failures of. We are going to show you, I am going to show you how to write a test driver uh, con which is, which captures a concurrency unit test for checking that the failure detector is working correctly and I will show you uh, concrete safety and liveness specifications for this test case. Okay. Can uh, folks at the back of the room see this, uh, the code here? If not, there are plenty of uh, seats available in the front, please move to the front. Okay. So uh, at the top here you see event declarations. Okay. So each event declaration um, has a name, the name of the event and then a type uh, given after the colon. So here is an event ping and its payload is of type machine. Machine is the type uh, for uh, all you know machine identifiers. It's the value that is returned when you create a new machine, right? And the only operation you can do on it is pass it from one place to another. And you can of course send to a uh, value like that. So then here we have this machine, uh, the uh, failure detector. So there's a bunch of uh, uh, state variables in here. Um, you can see some of the types that I was talking about earlier. You have sequence map, integer, uh, it also uses a timer. Uh, of course, it has to use a timer because there is no other way to see uh, uh, whether a node has failed or not. You can't wait uh, infinitely long to, uh, to get a response back from a node uh, because if it has failed, you will never get a response back. Okay, so, um, so it starts exec execution in the state init and it initializes uh, its variables, creates the new uh, instance of a timer um, and moves into the send ping state. Um, I'm not. I'm going to rush through uh, this code. Uh, I'll highlight a few interesting uh, things about it, but you don't need to, uh, you know, follow all the details of it. Uh, one thing to note here is the event-driven structure of the code. So you have these states, and inside each state, you have these event handlers. So this uh, uh, action here, for example. Uh, annotated by entry is the code that gets executed when you enter a state. Um, when the pong event is received in this state, then you execute this code here. Right? <coughs> On timeout, you, you execute uh, this code. Um, so what is going on here is that um, in this, uh, um, the, 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 the set of nodes that are being monitored, their addresses are in the nodes variable. Um, and inside the alive variable, we maintain uh, the set of those nodes, that subset of nodes, which is currently deemed to be alive. So uh, uh, we send a ping message to the nodes that are currently deemed to be alive, and if they don't respond within a certain amount of time, then you remove them from the alive. Okay. I want to show you the logic for handling cancel cancel timer. So remember, we were talking about. Um, uh, the model of uh, uh, timer yesterday, 
uh, where uh, if a timer is cancelled, then it can respond with either cancel success or cancel failure. Uh, well, every every once in a while, uh, the failure detector has to cancel a timer that it previously started. Um, in that case, it has to go through this protocol. So it sends uh, to the timer machine the cancel event, and then it uh, waits to receive either cancel success or cancel failure. So if uh, and it records which one it received in the local variable timer cancelled and returns it. So if timer was successfully cancelled, that means we don't need to wait in the client in the client of this function. No, don't need to wait uh, for the uh, timeout event to show up. But if it, uh, if it has uh, if it is evaluates to false, then you have to wait for the timeout event to show up. Okay, so that was the failure detector. Um, now I want to show you some specifications. Um, okay, so <coughs> so here's a, a safety specification. So um, when I wrote this code, uh, I wrote the code with the expectation that when these pings and pongs are flying back and forth. So failure detector is sending these ping messages to the nodes and the nodes are responding with a pong message. I wanted to make sure that the number of outstanding ping messages is always bounded. Okay, that's what that was my design intention. So I'm trying to capture that here um, in this logic here. So I'm maintaining a map called pending from uh, node IDs to the number of outstanding ping messages. Okay, and whenever a ping happens, uh, I increment pending by one, and whenever pong happens, I decrement pending by one. Okay. And I, I just wrote down this assertion. I, I sort of created a ballpark estimate that there should not be more than uh, three pending ping messages. So I put this assertion here. Okay, so this is this was my safety specification. Then I also want to show you a liveness specification. Um, so to see that, to understand, to appreciate the liveness specification, let me first show you the the unit test. So the unit test is indicated by this main machine called driver. So this is like the test driver. Uh, the test driver um, uh, creates a whole bunch of nodes, right? So this loop it creates two nodes. Um, it initializes the, uh, the the liveness monitor. It creates the failure detector machine, and uh, then it does something uh, very very interesting. It sends to each node that was earlier created the halt message. So the halt message is a way to simulate. Uh, machine failure, right? So halt is a special event in P. When a machine dequeues the halt event, it just terminates execution. Okay. So this, by by creating such a test harness, uh, we have basically injected failures into the machine at some arbitrary after some arbitrary delay. Okay. So now, um, what this test harness roughly is doing is it's creating a bunch of machines and then terminating all of them. After some uh, non-deterministic delay, so in this liveness monitor, what we are trying to do is write the property that eventually all the machines are detected to be uh, dead, to be not alive. Okay. So um, I have a hot state in it, and control stays in this hot state as long as uh, the number of uh, nodes in the alive set is non empty when that set becomes empty then a transition is made into the done state so because this is hot and the this is not a hot state in order for um, uh, uh, an execution to be correct we must make sure it must happen that eventually the notification that uh, the uh, all the machines are terminated is sent to the clients so that's what this liveness monitor is trying to check Okay, so that went by pretty quickly. Did I lose everybody? Any questions? All right, liveness is hard. Okay, all right. So um, moving on. So let's uh, let's uh, switch gears now and move to. The algorithmic issue of how do we test large search spaces? 
So, in, in this um, in a concurrency unit test supposing you have um, yeah, so this is a good example. So, this is modeling the state of a P program okay? and uh, it is imagining that there are three machines that are that, that get started and in every state you can schedule one of any one machine. So, depending on which machine you schedule you get to a different state. So, you can see that there is this uh, uh, exponential explosion in the branching factor. So, in each state, um, so in the first state you have three outgoing edges from each one of those states you can again schedule any one of the three machines that currently exist you again get three outgoing edges and so on. So, if you get down to a depth k then the total number of possible executions is going to be uh, 3 to the power k Does that make sense. So, um, what is happening here is that uh, the number of possibilities is increasing exponentially with the length of the execution. So, we of course, want for realistic programs we do want to, be, to have tests that take go deep into the uh, execution of the program to test those kinds of behaviors. Um, but we are seeing that this is going to become uh, commentarially really challenging too many behaviors to test. So, um, uh, what do people what have people done in the past you know 20 you know past several decades. So, this is a problem well studied in the literature. So, um, uh, people have done depth first search they said ok well it is a very large search space, but we can still try to uh, to search it. Uh, so, the simplest uh, search procedure is depth first search um, and uh, it is implemented in uh, many model checkers. Does anybody is anybody here who does not know what a depth what depth first search is who does not know depth first search. Okay. So, depth first search hmm. okay. ah ok let us try this. Okay, so, depth first search is a graph algorithm the idea is that uh, you start from the initial state of the graph and you are trying to find out and ok. So, you have a target state and you have the initial state and you are trying to find out if the target state can be reached from the initial state. Okay. So, we are going to start traversing the graph. So, you start from this initial state okay, and then you pick some arbitrary order of the edges and you explore them in that order. So, let us say we explore these edges left to right. So, so what we will do is we will have a stack. So, we push S 0 on the stack and uh, then we take this transition and we arrive at S 1. Okay. Well, S 1 has more children. So, we are going to continue the execution. So, now we are going to push S 1 on the stack and then examine its children and so on. Right. So, depth first simply means that we are going to go all the way to the left and keep going keep going until we arrive at a state uh, which does not have any children. Imagine that the this graph is actually a tree. So, there are no reconverging paths and so on. Okay. So, we will go all the way to the to the left here we arrive at a state that does not have any successor. So, that means that this state is fully explored if you will then we pop it from the stack. Okay. Then we look at the current state at the top of the stack we see ok well we have explored its leftmost child let us look at the child right next to it. So, we get that guy right and then we push that on top of the stack and we keep keep doing the story right. So, the search proceeds you know like this like this like this and so on right this is called called depth first search. Okay. So, it is called depth first because it is going deep in one direction before popping back up. There are other styles of doing execution for, for example, we can do something that is called breadth first search. So, what is how does breadth first search work let us take a look at that. So, you start with S 0 again you always start with S 0. Okay. Now, in this time what we are going to do is we are going to put that in a queue as opposed to a stack. So, we put that in a queue then we again you know take S 1 we put that in the back of the queue. Okay. 
So, uh, this means that we always dequeue items from the front of the queue. So, this time we are going to look at S 0 and then we find ah it is not fully explored. So, I am going to take S 2 then I will put that in the back of the queue. Then again I have S 0 I will put S 3. So, I first generated S 0 then S 1, S 2, S 3. Then I will look at S 1, I will add S 4, S 5, S 6 to the back of the queue. Then I will take S 2, I generate. So, basically this is going level by level as opposed to going all the way deep. So, that is breadth first search. Okay, so, that was a quick tutorial on uh, depth first and breadth first search. So, depth first search is very popular because uh, for programs with high branching factor, this is much more space efficient than uh, breadth first search, right. Imagine, think about it this way, imagine that uh, the depth of the graph is small compared to its bushiness, right. So, with the depth first search, uh, the space bound on the stack is equal to the maximum length of the paths, right. Whereas, with breadth first search, basically, you know, after uh, at some point you are going to have all the states in a certain layer. So, we know that those states are increasing exponentially with the depth. So, your uh, space requirement is going to grow going, going to increase exponentially for a while right. So, that is why um, for bushy graphs uh, often depth for search is much more uh, space efficient. Yes. Yes, yes. So, that is right. So, how do you deal with cycles and all that stuff right. Um, so, in this here this was a very simple situation because uh, we had a tree. So, we knew that you cannot revisit a state if you follow a different path. So, there are two complications. One complication is that the graph may not have cycles, but it could still be a DAG. It could be that you know the leftmost child of S 2 was S 6 right. So, there is reconvergence. Another complication could be that well you know S 1 could have a path back to S 0, but there is actually a cycle in the graph. Both those problems are solved using the same mechanism. That mechanism is a state cache. So, in addition to the stack or the queue, you also maintain a set of visited states. And when you encounter a new state, before pushing it on the stack, you, ch you first check whether it is present inside that state that inside that set. If it is not present only then you push it on the stack, but before doing that you add it to that set. What that means is that if you revisit a state from multiple different paths, you are not going to it, it if it was visited once before it would be present in the set. So, that is why you will not add it to the stack the second time. It make sense? Pardon? Uh, ah, I see because you are thinking that um, because uh, I think that the reason you are saying that you should add it is because you are thinking that if you arrive at a particular state like this and when you arrive at like that they are really different things. So, you should continue exploring uh, this path also. Well, that may uh, actually be not true. It may be that if you does not matter how you arrive at a particular state for it the future of its execution it does not matter how you arrived at it. The information content in the state is the same. So, its future behavior will be the same also. So, you should actually if you have already explored uh, all paths uh, the first time around then the next time you arrive at the same state you can forget about it you do not have to explore any further. So, that is how state caching works. Yeah. That is right. So, you, there is no way that you can escape uh, randomization for polynomials. That is right. By the way, you, you are really into randomization. What is the deal here? <laughs> yes. No, no, I understand that. Actually, I have a question. So, is, is randomized, randomized algorithms your research area? No, it is not. Your, your research area is networking. I see. Okay randomization <laughs> I see. So, you are absolutely right. So, if the size of the graph. 
So, all these algorithms that I have been describing, um, they cannot do better than the number of nodes in the graph. Okay? So, uh, in fact, you know the number of nodes in the last layer is already exponential in the depth of the graph. So, the total number of nodes is already going to be exponential. So, none of these algorithms is going to do better than the number of nodes in the graph. So, if you're, the number of nodes in, your, uh, in the state transition graph of your program, of your P program or your concurrency unit test is uh, uh, very large, uh, then uh, most likely search is not going to finish. And that is a central problem everybody is wrestling with, right? Okay. So, I also uh, will propose various sorts of solution, some of which involving randomization and some not. Uh, but, you know, uh, it is good to take a moment and appreciate uh, uh, the challenge here. Okay? So, everybody with me on that? Things are looking up. I think we uh, went down with the whole liveness business, but I think things are perking up again. Okay. So, uh, <clears throat> okay, so we are talking about depth first search and we did all this discussion about the size of the graph and what not and it is very large blah blah blah. So, what is going to happen is that um, if there is a bug, let us imagine, okay, so let us imagine that you are doing depth first search. So, the way I explain depth first search is you go like this, then you go like this, then you go like this, then you go like this and so on, right. Now, imagine that there is a bug over here. Okay? Now, you are really screwed. Why? Because you know if this thing is very deep, then it is just going to get stuck over here and you are going to run out of time. Whereas, it might be that you know the bug is really shallow, it was available at this level 2 here, maybe the bug was here, but because you got stuck doing all sorts of crazy things over here, you cannot even find a shallow bug. Okay? So, this is a well known problem with depth first search that when you have very large graphs for which search is unlikely to terminate, it gets stuck in some corner case of that graph and may, it may even fail to find uh, shallow bugs. Okay? So, uh, we have an alternative, I told you about this other, uh, s no, no, before we go there. Ah, I will get to that, it is an advanced thing. So, I mean we, we talked about uh, this other thing, right? you do not have to do depth first search, you can do breadth first search, right? you do explore the graph layer by layer. So, if you first explore S 0, then you explore all the guys over here, then you explore all the guys over here. In that case, you are going to give more of an opportunity to find shallow bugs, okay? but that has its own uh, uh, disadvantages, it is not space efficient. Okay? All right. So, this is the sort of the general story. So, what, what, um, what researchers have come up with is this general class of techniques called search prioritization for finding deep bugs. Okay? So, the basic idea behind search prioritization is very simple. It is saying that when you have a very large graph, you treat it like an onion. So, everybody has seen an onion, there are these onion rings. Okay? So, what we are going to do is we are going to impose different kinds of onion rings on the graph. So, for example, there is a blue dashed onion over here and then there is a black solid onion over here. So, both these, these onions are of different characteristics, they are slicing and dicing the graph in different ways. So, if there is a bug here denoted by this little lady bird, lady bug, it may be that it is within the second onion ring of the blue dashed onion but it may be within the fifth ring of the black onion. So, in this case, assume that regardless of which onion you choose, the size of each onion ring is roughly the same. Okay? In this case, you are better off, which, which, which particular onion are you better off examining? Any guesses? Which onion should be picked in this case to find a bug quickly? the blue guy, right? Because the, uh, the obvious idea here is that we, we do it, we peel the search onion ring by onion ring. Okay? That is the clue here and we are going to hit that bug in the second onion ring if we chose the blue guy, but we are not going to hit it if we chose the black guy until the fifth layer. Okay? So, this is the general story 
and this is of course parameterized by these onions which are also called prioritization strategies. So, let us look at a few uh, prioritization uh, strategies. So, turns out that that breadth first search that I was describing to you earlier, it is a kind of prioritization strategy. It is saying that uh, you have a weight on executions, the weight of an execution is, a, is its length and you, uh, uh, you basically have this onion ring where onion rings where uh, you have all executions with length 0, then you have all executions with length 1, then with length 2, then with length 3 and so on. Okay? Um, well, people figured out that you know that is good, but it is uh, it's going to be space inefficient. So, then they combine breadth first search and depth first search and they call it iterative depth bounded search. So, iterative depth bounded search is the idea is very simple. You are going to do depth, depth first search, but you are going to do depth first search with a bound. Okay? So, you can say I am going to do depth first search with bound 1. So, what that means is that if ever the length of my stack becomes uh, is about to become 2, I am going to stop exploring. Okay? So, I am going to look at uh, executions only up to the depth bound and within the that set I am going to do depth first search. Okay? So, I try to get the best of both worlds. I am space efficient and I am also doing uh, iterative deepening. So, I am looking at executions. Uh, onion ring by onion ring. Okay? <clears throat> so, this is, this is all good, both these things are reasonable, but of course, you know they fail to find deep bugs. So, we solve the problem of finding shallow bugs, but now we are, <laughs> we, we are in this other problem, now we cannot find deep bugs. So, going back to the slide I showed you earlier, remember I was saying that oh you know depth for search went like this, da 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 da, right? and then it is just messing around over here and for that reason it does not find the bug over here. Well, what, what if you know the bug was over here, right? it was deep over here. In that case, if you are doing the search layer by layer and the number of states is increasing exponentially with the number of layers, now you do not, you will not be able to find the bugs over here. right? So, this is the problem with iterative deepening based on the depth criterion. You do not give a good chance uh, to the search algorithm to find deep bugs. Okay. Yes. When you're doing iterative deepening, yeah, I think that, so. That's one uh, wasteful thing about uh, iterative depth bounded search. So when you increase the depth to k plus one, you end up exploring all the states up to depth k also. So that's wasteful about iterative deepening with the depth first search. Okay. Yes, yes. That's correct. Once you have found an error, you don't need to explore any further. No, no, no. It's not because it's because no, the case the case that uh, we're talking about here is wh is when you I mean so, you had a depth, you first explored up to depth k. You actually did not find an error, that is why you incremented the depth to k plus 1. So, now you are going to explore all those guys that were up to depth k to generate the states that are at depth k plus 1, right. So, all that work is wasted, that is what we are talking about. Because in those, we already know that there is no error. But in order to generate any state at depth k plus 1, you have to go through all the states uh, that are at depth uh, k or less. Yep. No, it should be the other. My intuition says the other way. Okay. I mean, but I, I mean you are assuming some kind of a distribution, right? Yeah. That these bugs are sort of <laughs> uniformly distributed. That is not the characteristic of these bugs. 
they are more like uh, the closer analogy would be like um, uh, you know needle in a haystack kind of deal. Yeah. yeah. No, so it is not like that I think, yeah. No, I mean not in the kinds of uh, systems, I mean uh, programs in general uh, are not well behaved. I mean you, you, you when you write code, right, it is often like this, you make a little change and your conditional evaluates from true to false and then you just go off on some, you know, some part of the world that has never been seen before, right, it is just completely, the, the behavior of the program completely changes by switching one conditional somewhere. Yeah. That first you do the first layer then you do the last layer. Well the problem is that uh, these, uh, this graph is not given to you explicitly. You can only construct this graph by executing the program. You see what I mean? So even to get to the last layer you have to first go through the intermediate layers, right? Yeah. Oh boy, I should have completely skipped the liveness business. All right. So okay, where are we? Okay, so so we are at this point where we have been examining uh, this business of about doing reachability on a graph from various angles. Sometimes we find shallow bugs. Sometimes we find deep bugs. Some if you if you're good at finding shallow bugs, we are bad at finding deep bugs. If you are good at finding deep bugs, we are bad at finding shallow bugs, and so on and so forth, right? So, so what we what we want is that. So it is pretty clear that one strategy is not going to nail everything. So we want many different strategies, which can all be potentially tried. Okay. Um, so what other strategies can we can we pull out, right? So we should think about that. So here's another strategy. It's called schedule prioritization. So what we are going, what we want to do here is that we don't want to do prioritization based on the length. Okay. We want to look at entire schedules and figure out a way to prioritize an entire execution over another entire execution. Because the problem with the other approaches were that we were doing prioritization based on length and that is why we were getting stuck in one place or another. So the question is how do you, how do you specify the prioritization function that says okay well I want to prioritize the schedule A1 over the schedule A2. Okay. How do you do that? Because this graph is not given to you as an explicit entity, right? The graph uh, becomes available to you as you explore the program, right? So these schedules are not given to you in your hand. You can't really examine them until you have generated them, right? So that's the issue. Okay. So, so what that means is that. Um, we need to somehow refer to schedules in an indirect way, in an abstract way. So I'll, I'll, I'll give you a few ideas that have bubbled up in the uh, literature. So one idea is uh, use context switches to prioritize uh, schedules. So here the idea is that, so what is a context switch? I mean this phrase context switch comes from uh, multi-threaded programs. That is a program is being scheduled by the operating system. So, you know it runs a thread for a while and then uh, its time quantum expires. So, uh, the OS uh, pulls a thread down and then schedules uh, another thread in the program in its place. Okay? And then that is how it keeps going back and forth among uh, different threads. So, a context which happens at a point when a thread is stopped and another thread is scheduled in its place. Okay? So, uh, why, so one, one possible uh, strategy is we say that let us bound the number of context switches. Okay? So the interesting thing here is that bounding the number of context switches does not bound the execution length. It rather bounds something that is a little bit like the interference in an execution between concurrently executing entities. Okay? Because the reason it does not bound the execution itself, the length of the execution itself because each context itself the number of steps for which a thread executes before being interrupted that you don't you're not specifying any bound on that okay so this was the first uh, uh, proposal uh, for scheduled prioritization uh, in the literature 
and it has some very interesting properties. So, so there is this uh, you know this whole business about model checking. How many people have heard about heard the phrase model checking here? Okay, well, I think I'm going to skip this one. Let's keep going. <laughs> yes. Huh? Pardon? Yes. No, I don't see why. I mean, it's a different way of bounding the number of contexts, which is a prioritization with respect to the number of contexts, which is, it's a different way of, it's a different onion, right? It's a different onion, right? So you can do schedule search based with using any onion. So I didn't understand the argument you're making. Oh, no, 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 it's not like that. So, if A1 is prioritized before A2, roughly the way to think about it is that there will be um, a whole bunch of guys whose priority is equal. So, you'll first generate all of them without generating all the other executions whose priority is lower, right? Then you go after them, then you're in that order, right? So, you are always have this order of uh, execution in the search. You first explore the executions in lower onion rings before you explore the executions in larger onion rings. Yes, that's true. Yeah, so yes, I agree with you. So in fact, that particular wastage that you're talking about it's the same kind of wastage um, that occurs in iterative depth bounded search, right? Because even in iterative depth bounded search, when you're generating the uh, executions with depth k plus one, you actually go through executions with depth k. So that problem still remains. That problem still remains. Yes. But that problem you already had to begin with, as you can see even here, right? That problem was not introduced because we were doing prioritization with respect to schedules. I think that problem fundamentally comes because the, this transition graph is not given to you explicitly. It has to be discovered by executing the program. Okay. Okay, so then, so, so we talked about uh, schedule prioritization with context switches. So then there was a tweak on it, which is, you know, you distinguish between two kinds of context switches. Uh, forced and unforced. So a forced context switch is basically, you know, a threat arrives at a point, say, where it's blocked on acquiring a mutex, for example. It can't make progress. So the OS is forced to schedule a different thread. That's a forced context switch. An unforced context switch or a preemption is one where the threat can make progress, but because it's time quantum, time limit expired, uh, it was scheduled out. So um, uh, so a tweak on uh, context switches, uh, uh, schedule prioritization with context switches is with preemptions where you bound only the number of preemptions. You count only the number of preemptions that occurred in the execution. And that's the, the prioritization number. So this particular technique was implemented in a tool uh, called CHESS. Uh, it was a concurrency testing tool uh, for multi-thread programs. And I worked on that a few years ago. Um, and what we discovered when we applied it to uh, uh, benchmarks, uh, you know, even large multi-thread program, is that uh, you often find uh, bugs with a few preemptions, only looking at executions with a few preemptions. So it's a good prioritization strategy, at least for shared memory uh, uh, concurrent programs. Another nice thing about this prioritization strategy is that if a bug is discovered with few preemptions, the execution looks easy. It's easier to understand. On the other hand, if there's a lot of preemptions going in and happening in an execution, it becomes very hard to comprehend what is going on. So it becomes harder to uh, find the root cause of the bug and to fix it. Questions? Yeah. 
yeah, I mean, these are all, you know, uh, you know, un incomplete tactics. Ultimately, you are going to run out of time. Doesn't matter what onion you use, and there will be all these behaviors that you haven't gotten to, and maybe there's a bug lurking there, and you didn't get to it. These are not, uh, you know, proof strategies. These are more like search strategies. If you want to do proofs, then uh, that's a different, uh, you know, that's a different talk. Yeah. Okay, so, <clears throat> so, I, I, so, so there's a new, so there's yet, yet another uh, generalization of schedule uh, prioritization, um, which, which generalizes all the other things uh, that, that I've mentioned to you before. So uh, that's called uh, prioritization based on delaying schedulers. Okay, so, um, so how should I explain this? Okay. Let us give it a shot. Okay. So, so let, me, let me first define what a scheduler is, a deterministic scheduler. So, a deterministic scheduler is a strategy for executing a concurrent program in which the next uh, process or machine that is picked is fixed based on the history of the execution so far. Okay. So, as an example, consider a round robin scheduler, right. So, this is an illustration of uh, round robin uh, scheduling. Imagine that you have uh, three threads T1, T2, T3, um, and we first pick T, we will first execute T1, then we execute T2, we execute T3, and so on, then T1, T2, T3, and so on. So, the way you would actually implement this kind of scheduler is that you maintain a queue. So, in the queue, you have uh, in, in, it is initialized with T1 followed by T2 followed by T3. You uh, pick the guy that is at the front of the queue, you schedule it, and then you put it at the back of the queue. And you again pick the guy that is at the front of the queue, you schedule it and put it at the back of the queue. So, this is deterministic because only one schedule is going to be generated. Okay, so this is great for if you if, if you wanted deterministic execution. But this is not so good if you are interested in using this to search the space of possible schedules. Because you are just generating one schedule, what is the point, right? There could be so many other possible schedules. So, then what we are going to do is, we are going to start with a deterministic scheduler, and we are going to provide a mechanism to perturb it. So, that if enough perturbation is applied, you can generate all possible schedules, okay. So, this perturbation can be captured by what I call the delay operation, okay. So, the delay operation can be anything that you want, right. In this particular case, the delay operation basically is implemented by saying that whoever is at the front of the queue, do not schedule it, just put, put him at the back of the queue. So, that way you get to skip some threads every once in a while. So, here for example, I schedule T1, put it at the back of the queue, now T2, now T2 I applied delay, so I did not schedule it. I uh, So, if I do that, why is this? Oh, no, 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 I see. So, I schedule T1, then I schedule T2, and then I apply the delay operation. So, what that means is that the guy who was at the front of the queue was T3. I instead of scheduling it, I just removed it and put it at the back of the queue. So, now uh, when I schedule the next guy, it is T1 because T3 has been moved to the back of the queue. Okay? So, by injecting a delay here, but for the rest of the execution by following the same default deterministic scheduling strategy, I have now generated a different schedule. Okay? You can imagine that if you did not do the delay here, you did the delay over here, you would have generated yet another schedule. So, by applying the delay operation at different points inside the schedule, you, you will generate different schedules. right? Okay? So, here we generated a whole bunch of schedules different from each other by choosing the point at which to apply the delay operation. But we forced ourselves to apply only one delay operation. We did not use two delay operations. Well, you can try to use two delay operations. So, then in that case, you are going to generate more schedules. Then you can go to three delay operations, you generate even more schedules. right? So, the story here is that this is yet another kind of onion. You basically define an onion 
by defining a deterministic scheduler with a delay operation and then you keep generating more and more onion rings by increasing the number of available delay operations. If your uh, scheduler and the delay operation is, are defined in a nice way, then you will be guaranteed that if you give enough delay budget, you will end up generating all possible schedules. So, this is a very general mechanism that subsumes all prior uh, schedule prioritization strategies, right? Because it takes as a primitive this concept of a deterministic scheduler and a delay operation. And you can completely influence, so it is a very general way of defining the onion, right? How do you convince yourself? Uh, the reason is that you are uh, basically flipping a coin and the number of cars that you basically end up visiting could, at least, could be a smaller set, could be a polynomial subset of the exponential set of cars. No, I did not understand the question. So, the number of cars is exponential, you are basically using that, but you uh, are so just uh, basically using this delay operation and it, it could be a possibility that you are visiting a small fraction of all so it is certainly it is certainly true that if your number of delays is bounded by d then the number of possible paths that you will generate would be exponential in d only it will not be uh, uh, the full set but notice that you can keep increasing d if you increase d to be very large then in the limit you will generate everything Okay, so then you can basically do, uh, you can peel the onions uh, by using a particular delaying scheduler. So, what you will do is you will first generate executions with zero delay, then inside that execution there are, let us say that the execution has length L, then you pick uh, a particular position in that execution to inject a delay. Depending on which position you pick, you will generate uh, more executions with one delay and then you keep doing that and you will generate basically a graph of uh, executions over executions right where uh, the each layer corresponds to executions with a certain number of delays reachable with a certain number of delays okay so now um, let's turn our attention to sampling okay so sampling is yet, yet another uh, tool in our arsenal for searching large state spaces. So, why is sampling, randomized sampling good? So, it is good, in my opinion, the, the, the most important reason why it is good is because it is so simple, so simple to implement. Uh, imagine the simplest possible uh, randomized sample algorithm, it is called a random walk. So, you have a graph, right, and you start with the start state. Then you pick one successor at random, you walk to that one, then you pick another successor at random, you walk to that one, right? And when you reach the end and you arrive at a state that has no successors, you have sampled one entire run in the, in the graph and then you can restart from the very beginning and find another run. So, it is trivial to implement. You do not have to maintain data structures like stacks or queues or whatever. Each sample is completely independent from each other and as a result, you can also uh, efficiently parallelize the search. So, you can start lots of random seeds you know and uh, on as many machines as you wish and each one of them is executing this uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a loop. So, very easy to trivial to parallelize. So, for all those reasons um, <clears throat> and also notice that um, um, it, it, it is already not biased towards uh, exploring shorter or longer executions. It is just a random walk. So, uh, it will just keep running the program. If you have a bug that is deep, um, it may it may end up finding it. So random walk has this uh, sort of nice property. You know, it's a trivial property, but nice nonetheless. That um, uh, in every sample, uh, every sample can generate any execution with non-zero probability, right? And that's nice. Okay, so. Uh, so, uh, people have investigated random sampling also because uh, if you are dealing with you know finite testing budget in terms of time, uh, then oftentimes you know if you try to use deterministic 
uh, search strategies, search ends up getting stuck somewhere or the other. So why not throw random sampling into the mix also? So the basic random walk algorithm, uh, it's, it's very nice and uh, it does often find uh, bugs pretty fast. But it is also true that if, um, if you have a hard to find bug that requires certain events to happen in a certain fixed sequence and there's a, a sort of long chain of these events, uh, then the probability of finding them at large depth will become vanishingly slow, vanishingly low. So we would like to be able to uh, use the notion of prioritization even to direct uh, random search also. So there's a way to combine uh, uh, random sampling with uh, uh, prioritized search also. So instead of uh, deterministically generating all executions with one delay and then all executions with two delay, you can try to do a random walk on this graph itself. So you start with the execution with zero delay. Now instead of enumerating all places where a delay can be injected, you randomly pick one location to inject a delay. So you uh, start doing a random walk on this graph itself. Okay. Uh, turns out that uh, this is pretty useful, and in uh, in 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 many 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 programs, many test problems, it actually works better than the vanilla random graph. Um, okay, so I, I was going to show you some of these tables, but uh, it's not that interesting, um, and I'm also running out of time. So I'll uh, basically conclude now. I just want to conclude by saying that uh, prioritization is applicable not just to scheduling choices, but also to non-deterministic choice, to dollar, right? So if you have a sequence of lots of dollars, lots of non-deterministic choices in your test program, then that can also cause uh, uh, exponential explosion, right? Instead of, so you have a branching factor of two. So uh, if you have chaining of uh, uh, non-deterministic choices, so if you have a chain of n non-deterministic choices, you will get, uh, 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 you know, a, a tree uh, uh, at at layer n, it will have two to the power n nodes, right? So that is that's, that is itself uh, a hard search problem, even without uh, 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 the complication of scheduling choices. While well, we can use uh, prioritization to prioritize non-deterministic choices, also, we can just have this uh, programming abstraction that we always prioritize false over true. So false has cost zero and true has cost one. We just tell the programmer this is how the testing tool is going to behave. So if you want to explore a certain choice before a different choice, take that choice, code it up in your test harness by uh, doing that on the false branch as opposed to on the true branch. So the programmer, the tester can use this, uh, this abstraction and program against it. Um, so um, in, in, my, uh, uh, in my company, um, uh, engineers in Office Core platform, uh, they, they, they were familiar with the, the, the P system and the prioritization it, it, it implements. So they implemented this uh, uh, prioritization of uh, non-deterministic choices in a framework, testing framework for client server applications called Tribit. Uh, and they're using it over there. It's pretty cool. Okay, well, uh, just a reminder that P and P sharp are, is, is available open source. Uh, check it out. and. Uh, uh, I'd love to hear feedback from you guys. And I hope I have convinced at least some of you to work in the area of programming languages and verification. All right, I'm done. Questions? Yeah. <coughs> Uh, there can be asynchronous inputs that are coming in. So yes. how do you uh, change this test methodology? So whatever test you have mentioned is the No, no, that's not true because uh, the way you model asynchrony is by having a machine. So imagine that uh, you can model the environment, the asynchronous input as a test machine uh, that sends messages to this program. So because they are both running concurrently, the input from this a uh, test machine can arrive anytime after an arbitrary delay. That's how you, uh, you model asynchronous input. I mean, it will try all possibilities, right? There's no notion of time, so it will just try all the places. Do we have, yeah. Uh, sir, does P offer something like a way to async sort of prototypes that we have in C sharp? Ah, yes, yes, good question. Yes, it does. So. Yeah, I didn't emphasize it, but since you asked, I will show you the code. Check this out. 
So, this is the how the timer cancellation is being handled. Look at this. Whoa. Oh, I think I hit uh, the debug button. Sorry. So, so in this code here, um, the failure detector sends to the timer machine the cancel event, right? And then it is waiting for a cancel success or cancel failure. So here it does. Uh, you, there's a statement in P called receive. So this receive statement blocks looking for either one of these two events, okay? And then if it receives cancel success, it executes this code. When it receives cancel failure, it executes this code. So this blocking receive is implemented using uh, continuations. This is precisely what happens in uh, C sharp with the uh, await construct, right? So if it is, if this event is already available, then you don't create the continuation, you just zip through it. But if, if it blocks, then you package up the continuation and you stash it. And then later on when the event arrives, you unpack it and then start executing. Okay. No more questions? Okay, so let's thank uh, Shaz again.